see a lot of Heidi in the future. Glad to have you with us, Heidi. So now let me introduce Professor Jorge Cuadros, uh, the Director of Informatics Research, uh, who will be talking to us on preventing diabetic blindness with IPAX, which is a low-cost store and forward telemedicine system. Uh, Jorge started uh, starting in 1994, developed several programs for remote clinical diagnosis and distance learning, including programs in China, India, and Latin America. The subject for today's talk, entitled IPAX, was developed as an open access system for clinical communication in eye care and has been used for teleconsultations, telecons retinopathy screening, home care education, and other applications. Uh, Jorge is a member of the American Medical Informatics Association and the American Telemedicine Association. And those of you who have been coming to these exchanges for some time know that telemedicine is, is a very important part of the CITRUS program housed at UC Davis Medical Center in Sacramento. And we're very proud to have that as an affiliate program with CITRUS. So Jorge, without further ado, let us welcome you in our usual fashion. And thank you for coming today. Testing. Uh, it's on. Good. Okay. Now, as far as where to stand, I. Uh, Wherever you want. Okay, by the podium, and it's following me. Great. Okay. <laughs> All right. I think this will work better because this way I can see the slides. And um, I'm really glad to be here today. Um, and when I learned about Citrus and the projects that were going on here, I was really amazed and humbled. Um, I've been doing my projects with telemedicines for, for a while, but um, compared to some of the stuff that's coming out of here, it's, it's just amazing that what, what, uh, what's been developed in, in your group. At any rate, um, I'd like to start off just putting aside the clinical part, because um, we're u I usually lecture to a clinical audience, but I want to concentrate more on the, uh, the other aspects but in order to get a, an idea of what it is we're trying to accomplish, um, about six minutes uh, I'd like to take to, um, to explain with a video what the project is about. Okay? So let me put that on. Whoops. Hold on a minute. Try this one more time. Okay, please don't don't criticize the acting in this. It was playing just a second ago. Okay, I can close this. All right. So I think we gotta turn off, turn off quick time and start up again. Oh, we got the sound. I think if you, yeah. Nope. So um, maybe we can minimize PowerPoint. And it's the uh, that <clears throat> it's this one right, right here. Yep. <clears throat> Someday I'm going to vacation in the Caribbean. I'm going to buy a voodoo doll that looks like Bill Gates and stick pins in it. <laughs> I was just thinking that this uh, reminds me of Bill Gates when he was uh, presenting uh, Windows XP, right? And he <laughs> All right. Okay, 
This will give us a few more minutes. Diabetes is the main cause of blindness among working age adults in this country. Yet 90% of these cases can be avoided with early detection and treatment. The problem is that half of patients with diabetes don't get the regular eye exams every year. This problem is worse in communities that are separated by cultural and social barriers, such as poorer communities or rural communities. We care for low-income, underserved, underinsured patients, and they don't have good insurance or payer sources for outside eye exams. So we would always refer them out, making them appointments, and then because of their transportation, language issues, and money issues, just wouldn't go. Yo no sabía que podía perder la vista hasta que fui con mi doctora y me hicieron un examen. Yo nunca me había hecho un examen antes y su asistente tomó fotos a mis ojos con una cámara especial y fue cuando me mostraron cómo podían quedar mis ojos y cómo estaban sangrando por dentro y todo eso. Our problem is, as a very busy urban public hospital diabetes clinic, everyone needs to be screened, but we have limited access to eye services, and we weren't able to differentiate people who really needed services soon versus people who could wait until an appointment could actually be scheduled for them. The waiting time for diabetic patients to get their eye exam by ophthalmologists using county system could take up to six months to a year. And recently I saw a newly diagnosed diabetic patient and we scheduled the ophthalmology exam. While the patient was waiting for the ophthalmology exam, the routine eye exam, I saw him six weeks after that first visit. By the time I saw him six weeks later, he had already gone blind. The man went blind within three months waiting for a routine eye exam. I couldn't take that anymore. And that is the reason I decided to institute diabetic retinopathy screening in THE clinic. So we can identify our patients that are at risk and prevent diabetic blindness. Why do patients lose sight from diabetes? Chronic uncontrolled blood sugar causes damage to small vessels in the eye leading to the death of nerves and receptors. Diabetic retinopathy screening can detect sight-threatening changes before it's too late. That's why researchers at UC Berkeley and UCSF have developed IPACS, a license-free, internet-based program that allows patients to be screened at the time of their primary care visit. It also allows primary care providers to communicate with eye care providers at UC Berkeley and also in their own community. As a retinal specialist, I have found retinal images very useful in detecting ocular complications and diabetic retinopathy screening using digital retinal photography does not take the place of an eye exam. However, it has been recognized by both uh, the American Diabetes Association as well as the American Academy of Ophthalmology as an effective way to identify patients with retinopathy who need referral for ophthalmic management as well as treatment. The ophthalmologists love the program because we're actually able to send them referrals that are very appropriate to the services that they offer. Patients like IPACs because the photos are used at the point of care to help educate them. Digital retinal photography has performed better than face-to-face -face eye exams for detecting diabetic retinal lesions. In fact, several landmark studies have validated retinal photography for the detection of diabetic retinopathy. Large-scale retinopathy screening systems have been reported to be used successfully at the Veterans Administration as well as Kaiser. First of all, it's very important to create a service that has a low cost to you. So you follow the grid line? Look at the grid line. So we have utilized medical assistants who are, you know, very eager to be trained to learn a new skill, and yet at the same time they are a lower cost to us. This camera is a regular camera. And this is a special, a special lens. This is very, very easy to take a picture. And it, for me now, it's taking me about five minutes to take a picture. There's not really a great additional cost incurred by the clinic. For the patient, that's good because, especially for our sliding fee patients, 
the eye exam is integrated into the office visit that they've already paid for so there's no additional cost to the patient and that's really increased compliance and their ability to get that exam. That office visit of course is reimbursable, the procedure is reimbursable. When any significant retinal disease is picked up through the IPAC system, we're able then to target those referrals as urgent referrals, give the patients an appointment, and we found that our compliance with eye exams went from around 25% up to the high 90s. We feel we have actually been able to prevent advanced eye disease, blindness, um, and uh, it's really been an enormous quality tool for our clinic. At least we can take our own retina scan and identify those high-risk patients for early intervention so we don't have any more of our patients go blind. If we can avoid one patient losing their sight by doing these exams on site, the program is a total success. For more information, please contact the IPAX program. Thank you. This program is supported by the California Healthcare Foundation. Can't, can't uh, leave that part out. <clears throat> um, all right. Well, thanks for for um, paying attention to the uh, to the video there. And now that we have that part behind us, so that's the clinical problem that we're trying to address with the IPAC system, um, and. All right. And now I, I want to get more into the organizational parts and some of the technical parts and some of the other issues related to the project that we're doing that may be of interest to, to you. Um, so the problem that we were facing, as you saw in the, uh, in the video, was that the traditional healthcare encounter wasn't really working for this population. And we, were, we really are just focused on underserved populations, uninsured people that, that uh, don't have a lot of means. But the problem with diabetic uh, eye disease is uh, prevalent in all populations. So it doesn't matter the, the economic level that you're at. Um, there's still a big disconnect between people going to the traditional healthcare encounter, the eye exam, um, when they have diabetes. Usually that's left aside. And they go when there's a problem. And oftentimes, by, by that time, it's too late. Um, so so um, the uh, typical healthcare encounter, you know, there's a, there's a health problem that needs to be addressed. You visit the trusted doctor who gives you advice, is an intelligent person, someone that you trust. And then you get the remedy, and, it, and, and then you go home. There's a lot of problems with that. Um, and uh, the video just demonstrated one problem, that's just the logistics of getting to the office, having to wait, having to pay for, for those services, but also is getting harder and harder for the trusted physician, Marcus Welby, to have everything in his mind. You know, the explosion of medical information is getting um, extreme. It, um, there was one slide from another PowerPoint that I saw recently that uh, showed that for a medical graduate just getting out of school to be current with medical literature, just in their own field, they would have to read something like 800 articles. Um, no, no, no. They would have to read, if they read two articles a day, by the end of one year, they would be 800 years behind. <laughs> so there's a lot of information being put out there. There's been more and more emphasis on evidence-based medicine that's uh, emphasis on making sure that the physicians uh, and other providers are following um, the proper evidence-based practice using protocols and, and um, other guidelines um, to ensure good outcomes. So whereas before, the traditional doctor may have just had one thought in his mind, you know, maybe for this patient, pneumococcus or something. The diagnosis, now they're thinking about, well, you know, um, am I following the proper guidelines for discharging this patient? You know, what's their insurance situation like? What is their, um, you know, am I going to get paid? You know, um, all, a bunch of other things. And, and then having to hand the care off more and more to subspecialists and other people who are going to get involved. So complexity has really um, changed this uh, panorama quite a bit. 
So, uh, so there's the issue of access to specialty care. And that's very well addressed with just a general telemedicine. And I saw a um, presentation, a really good presentation by a pediatrician from UC Davis on telemedicine. I think it was a few, uh, a few of the sessions back. Very well done. And he talked more about the, the regular kind of telemedicine, the, the mainstream telemedicine. Actually, telemedicine now has a mainstream. It's uh, where you're emulating the, um, the patient-doctor visit. So you're using teleconferencing um, uh, equipment and teleconferencing applications to be able to emulate what happens with the patient, you know, seeing the doctor in person. Um, and um, I'm getting ahead of myself. And that's gotten a lot of support because by having the, the right bandwidth and having the right equipment, you can see someone for a psychiatric visit or... Uh, for some other um, pediatric visit, you know, even if they're in a rural site, uh, they don't have to be right there in the same room. Um, at any rate, that's not how I started doing telemedicine, and I started doing it before I even knew that it was telemedicine. Back in 1994, I was able to get a um, digital camera, which back then was like $9,000 for 1.5 megapixel. <laughs> so I think you get those on your cell phones now and was able to mount it on my microscope, and um, I had a problem that I was trying to address. And the problem was that my, my patients in my own office were predominantly Spanish-speaking. And so when I referred them out for specialty care, they'd get lost through the cracks. You know, either the, you know, the, the referral form got separated from the patient and the doctor didn't know what the person was talking about. At any rate, I felt like I needed more control by being able to send images to the specialists, um, I was able to experiment and see, wow, this, is, this really can be very effective. This is a, a gardener who got hit in the eye with a rock, had uh, bleeding inside the eye. I wanted to know, you know, what do I need to do? Is it treatment or, or observe? And um, so the answer came back to just observe, you know, do nothing, and I can do that pretty well. So um, I followed him over a week, and, uh, and it resolved. Now, that was back in 1994. Since then, telemedicine has really evolved, and uh, some really great applications. We have Dr. Schwarzenegger over here on the, on the left-hand corner, is, um, is a big proponent of telemedicine, and has been, uh, uh, I guess, in, in one way or another, uh, supporting the efforts that are going on in California. I guess that's a, an issue that we shouldn't talk about right now. But um, Cisco Systems came out with a, a medical pod it's a telepresence pod for doing real-time telemedicine where you have the patient on, on, on one side of the video and uh, the person on the other. But the telemedicine that I was doing from e even back then is, is called Storm Forward. And it's an asynchronous transfer of the images. The reason why it worked for me was because the specialists weren't going to sit and wait for my camera to be set up and get the patient ready and them on the other side and, and, uh, and do a consult. They just wanted to look a picture, tell me what was going on, and, and, be, and be done with it, and go on with their work. Um, and so that's a basic explanation of the storm forward um, type of telemedicine. Um, and we found that it was very useful for, for doing um, these types of consults. And it also fit into this other model of, of the healthcare encounter. So rather than just seeing it as a single encounter, you can, divide the, you can divide it into three different elements. So the, there's a lot of work being done to automate gathering the data. There's measurements that you can do either in, in home care, you can do a lot of measurements and uh, record them, transmit them, you know, blood sugar, you can get eye pressure now from, from little uh, devices that you can send home with the patient. Uh, more and more is being automated. Uh, more and more is being delegated. So the physician no longer does most of the stuff that, uh, that's needed you know, to gather the data. When I, uh, as an optometrist, not as a physician, but as an optometrist, when I was first getting out of school, we did everything. And now the assistants will you know, take the acuities. I'm sure many of you have had eye exams already. You know that first you go with the assistant. They'll you know, measure, do the automated readings, maybe take pictures, 
And then you see the, 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 uh, the eye doctor who then makes decisions based on that data and then communicates with you. Well, the decision making is also becoming more complex with, with all the protocols, guidelines, things we talked about before. Uh, and having access to knowledge bases is becoming uh, quite a big, a big deal. There's a whole department over at Stanford, the medical informatics department over there, um, building that's, that's devoted to, um, to figuring out new ways to be able to access that information. Uh, decision support systems, I'm sure you're very well aware of in, in all the other fields, it's affecting medicine as well and healthcare. The other thing that we're also learning is that communication isn't always best done by the physician or the optometrist or the provider. Sometimes you need to bring in other people. You know, there's a whole issue of cultural competence, there's, there's a, a whole movement of health promoters, people that have the same, same uh, condition as, as the patients, being able to talk them through and get them to, to get on board with their, with their health care. Because we know that for chronic disease, um, it takes a lot of participation by the, by, the, um, by the patient and needs a lot of motivation and, and that's another area. So all of these three elements can be connected um, by different devices and different systems. So no longer is, is just the, um, the physician doing it. Anyway, I just wanted to explain that perspective on the healthcare encounter and then talk a little bit more about, um, about what we're doing then, just in, in that framework. So these are retinal cameras that uh, take digital images of the back of the eye. And um, there's a number of new cameras coming out that are bigger, better, faster, and the technology is moving very quickly. So <clears throat> if you have limited resources and you're going to spend a lot uh, of, of your resources just on a certain technology, you have to make sure that it's going to be able to evolve over time since it's a, it's a fast-moving um, field. And uh, these are all new retinal imaging devices, some that take large areas of the retina. This is a 160-degree field of the retina, which some of you will know what I'm talking about there. Um, and there's also been a movement to try to bring the price down on retinal cameras. And right now, um, the typical camera that's used for doing diabetic eye screening is about $20,000. Um, these people in Australia say they have a camera now for 5000 that they want to put on the market. We'll see what happens. But there's been other efforts as well. This is another group. Um, and there's some, some folks even around here that believe that, well, maybe, maybe for just the purpose of retinal screening in a primary care setting, maybe it could be even cheaper. And then once it becomes that available, then what's that going to do to the, to the way people deal with retinal images, with eye images? Uh, right now, it's the retinal images are part of the eye exam. Eye specialists or eye clinicians are the ones who look at the retinal images. But if they're readily available, how will primary care people, just the general providers, how will they interact? Is that information important to them? And what we're learning is that most don't feel that it's that important right now, but the more that they're exposed to retinal images, the more important it becomes for them to be able to determine the microvascular status of their patients. So, so by looking at the retinal images, they're able to make better determinations about the general state of their, of their patients, seeing signs that would be associated with cardiovascular disease, with nephrop, you know, kidney disease, and, and other conditions. So our feeling is that by integrating the retinal images into primary care, not only will we be able to catch diabetic patients that are, have serious eye problems, but we can integrate that part of the, um, the retinal images into the general care of the patient. And that has yet to be borne out, but there's been a lot of work uh, underway to, to do this. Anyway, as far as retinal screening for diabetic eye disease, we're, you know, we're not really that new in doing it. There's many groups that are, have much larger programs than we do. This is Jocelyn Vision Network, and Novion is a commercial enterprise that was developed 
to do diabetic retinopathy screening as well. Wilmer I tell they have a device that automatically transmits their images over to, uh, to their reading center. Um, but our focus really is on, on a group that you know often um, doesn't get any attention because there's no money in it, <laughs> you know, frankly. It, um, so we needed to develop a system that was so cheap that it could be, um, that it could be adopted by the community clinics because there's no reimbursement mechanism for it, or very little. You know, if there was a reimbursement stream, there's a way to, to be able to get paid for uh, a sufficient amount, then um, I think everybody would be in it. <laughs> so our design principles for developing the IPAC system were, were based on that. And, um, and um, just to talk about the, how the in information flows, the images are captured in a, in a retinal camera, just like the ones that you saw. And then uh, just in any computer that's connected to the internet. And here we had to make a decision that the system couldn't have a client-side program because sometimes the networks don't allow uh, programs to be, uh, to be um, installed on their client computers in some of the clinics. You have to be able to go in and out of networks, in other words. And um, another issue was that then you have to update. And if you have users that are alert, attentive, motivated, no problem. They'll update it. But, but if you're dealing with a situation where there's limited resources, you have to make it very simple. So that our solution was just to um, have it all um, server-side so that any web any internet-connected computer could, could use the program. So the images are captured. They're collected with clinical data and, um, and stored on a server at, at UC Berkeley. Um, and then from there, um, you can notify a consultant or someone that you, that you would like to have look at the images. You can notify them via email. And then um, they can uh, transmit their, their consultation back to the server. And then that can be downloaded in the primary care provider's bra um, uh, computer and then printed for the patient file. Either printed or more and more now being incorporated into the electronic medical record. And th that's been a big issue is making it interoperable with electronic medical records. Uh, frankly, two years ago we didn't even have to worry about that because so few of the clinics and providers were even using electronic medical records. But now it seems to be growing very quickly. And it's uh, hopefully not going to be a Tower of Babel, you know, where you have to set up a different interoperation um, routine for each, for each group. What we're hoping to do is to have people compliant with, with uh, data standards so that we can write one interface and it'll work with all the different chronic disease registries and electronic medical records. So, Really, our, our objectives were to make um, a scalable, freely accessible, standards-compliant, image-capable communication system. Because um, what we found is the people really did want to communicate, not just in eye care, but between primary care and, and eye care. And um, it's, it was all about reducing barriers to, um, to having it used. And we know that, and this is from the medical informatics training, and, and uh, actually from some work in the 80s by uh, Terry Winograd that maybe some of you have come across, that just small increases, uh, small um, changes in the usability of, of a program create a huge difference in terms of how well it's adapted. And, um, and it really made a lot of sense, and it's really been borne out for us. Um, so we already talked about diabetes and what the problem is that we're trying to address. Our first group that we, that we uh, partnered with was a group in Fresno that had a chronic disease program. And they, they understood that, that people with diabetes have so many things going on. If they could bring them in and do one-stop shopping where they did their labs, did their, their, their um, nutrition, their pharmaceutical stuff, the primary care visit, their podiatry visit, and the eye test, that they would have much better compliance and their patients would have less complications. And they were able to prove that. I think it's a model that we'll be seeing more and more 
this one-stop shopping for chronic disease that brings in a number of dis different specialties. So rather than having a separate encounter for each specialty, you bring them all in and do it all at once, like a pit stop, you know, on a, on a racetrack. Um, and um, then, you know, there was an issue, okay, yeah, well, you're taking pictures, but that can't be as good as, as the face-to-face -face visit. Um, you know, and, and you're going to hear this over and over again from my care providers. You know, I talk, I'm uh, usually on a soapbox, you know, talking about how this is good for everybody, including the eye care providers, but they don't really buy it. You know, they say, well, if you're taking the pictures there, we're not going to see them in our office. Um, it it's really doesn't work that way. It doesn't take the place of a regular eye exam, but the images are actually better at detecting diabetic retinopathy than... Um, than the face-to-face -face exam. And um, that's been proven. There's been a lot of studies that, that have shown that, that the uh, sensitivity and specificity of detecting retinal lesions is much greater with, with images. And we had a case that we have here. This is a 23-year-old um, Latin American female, very uncontrolled diabetes, who was referred to a retinal specialist. This is someone who specializes in this type of care. And it was really obvious from the pictures that she has serious microvascular changes. You can see that. And the one thing we tell our patients, you know, if this is happening in your eye, it's happening in the rest of your body. So, and that's a, an effective um, motivator for patients to keep their diabetes under control. Um, this was the examination that we got back. This is a copy of the actual exam. He found that there was no retinopathy. See right here it says diabetes, but no retinopathy. Come back in one to two years. So the endocrinologist had his secretary call me and say, hey, what's, what's going on? Why you say it's severe, but, but uh, the, the retinal specialist says there's nothing there. So we had the patient come back, and, um, and we took more pictures. And this time I was able to send the images to a retinal specialist that works with us at Berkeley and to another one at Columbia University, both concurring that this is severe retinopathy that needs to be treated right away. And so um, that was a real good vindication of why you need to take pictures. <laughs> and so now, even in the live visits, patients that come to my office, if they're diabetic, will take pictures because I know that the pictures are better. Now, how long does it take to translate these things that we know into practice? You know, um, there was a survey done by Vision Service Plan. Still, most eye care providers don't have cameras, even though it's better. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next, in the next few years. Um, at any rate, so we've had a couple of years doing the IPAX program in the Central Valley. We set it up in 13 community clinics. Um, we also had let other clinics use it. And um, we collected a few thousand um, encounters. Now, after about two and a half years, we have 19,000 encounters recorded, about 70 encounters per day. And our goal is, and what we're commissioned to do with the California Healthcare Foundation is try to get to 100,000 encounters per year. And, uh, and still keeping this all license-free and freely available to the clinics. Um, one vindication also, another one, of our, of our system was our experience in Guanajuato, Mexico. These are the um, clinics in California. And then also we, we did a project in Guanajuato where you can imagine the resources are much less. And um, we, we went down, gave a lecture, talked about diabetic retinopathy to the physicians. We showed them IPACs, we showed them the camera. They bought themselves a camera. They taught themselves how to use the, the system. And eight months later, um, they started using it. And they took it from clinic to clinic. And the physicians themselves were taking the pictures and then sending them to us. So all of a sudden, we had these hundreds of cases coming through. And um, they were able to effectively start a diabetic retinopathy screening program just on their own. 
Um, and in a, in a little more than a year, did almost 7,000 encounters um, moving the camera every two weeks or so to another clinic. So that was a real good uh, proof for us that you could essentially, you know, walk up to the system and start using it. And that's what we wanted. That's our goal. There's still some, ca uh, some challenges. Um, connectivity issues aren't really as much of a challenge because you could take the pictures and then internet is almost everywhere. You can just upload from wherever you have an internet connection. Um, the cost of the cameras is coming down. Um, legislative issues, there's, you know, there's still no reimbursement <laughs> for this. It's a, it's a needed service, but you know, politics as they are don't uh, really uh, create much of an opportunity for reimbursement. And uh, the biggest issues are human and organizational. Uh, being able to integrate this into the patterns that, that healthcare people are accustomed to is very difficult. Just that idea of taking the healthcare encounter and taking it apart into the three elements is very difficult for people to really wrap their, their, their minds around, um, especially if they're used to doing healthcare a certain way. And that's going to take years, if anything. And um, organizational issues, you really have to have a strong commitment by not just the leadership, but by every, at all the levels in order to make this work because you're, you're taking an alien um, uh, system and putting it into, into, into an environment. Um, the other thing is that people have to have a vested um, belief, and they have to have a belief that they're doing the right thing. And it only takes a few cases. You know, once they get a, a case of serious retinopathy, then, then they're believers, and then there's no problem. But getting them to that stage can take months. It takes a lot of conversations and a lot of, um, a lot of back and forth. Um, but all in all, it's been successful. There's been a growing, uh, it, it's been accelerating. We're getting the system down a little bit more efficiently. And our goal is to continue to make it easier and easier to adapt to the way people are already doing things rather than making it alien. And that's the biggest problem I see with a lot of electronic medical records with a lot of other, with even regular telemedicine, is that when you disrupt that much, the way people do their business is just too hard to overcome. Um, and on that, I'd like to um, open it up to questions. Um, Hi, uh, that's a wonderful work, and I'm wondering, you've concentrated on retinal diseases, but in terms of imagery that could be uh, transmitted, uh, nowadays we have corneal topography with a video keratoscope, or even something simpler like a slit lamp uh, imagery for cataracts. Are, are you doing things for the anterior segment, or are there problems in that? Or? Well, the problems are not technical. As usual, the problems aren't technical. And, you know, if you have a hammer, you look around for something to, to, to hit on, right? Retinal disease was, and, and still is, the vast majority of the cases of, of preventable blindness are because of retinal disease. If there was, well, there's, cataract is going to blind more people, but it's treatable. It's not, it's not irreversible. You know, cataracts are very easy to detect. You could get a pen light. <laughs> You can do visual acuities and, and pretty much assume that they have cataracts. Um, these retinal cameras now, as part of our protocol, we do take an anterior segment picture, and we can get an idea of the cataract. From the red reflex, we can uh, get a good idea of what's going on as far as cataracts and, uh, and some other anterior segment diseases. Um, here in the United States, um, and in northern Mexico at least, the anterior segment um, problems aren't as, as, as big. And, and frankly, I'm not sure that, that you need to have the expert diagnosis by transmitting the image and having it observed and, and reported back on with anterior segment images as much. Every now and then, yeah, you do. Yeah. Also, I'd like to say that, that uh, one of the fantasies that I have, that, uh, and I'm making a confession now, and I know that I'm on video, this is going to be terrible. But one of the fantasies is that for people that have no access to any eye care, 
wouldn't it be great to be able to do the whole thing? To be able to take the anterior segment images, to be able to take pictures of the back of the eye, sufficient area to be able to feel comfortable that there's no disease, and then to measure their eyes and give them a prescription for glasses. Okay, I've just ruined my, my career. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry if I offended anybody out there in, in the web space, but um, I think that, that those are things that we need to think about that are going to happen. It's not just a matter of, of, of whether they should or not. They're going to happen. It's just how are we going to integrate that into society and everything. Yeah, that's, uh, you mean as far as uh, getting a, a prescription or... or no, there's no, if you had to wait for an aberrometry, you'd know there's no higher order aberrations. And then with, with be able to do your prescriptions. If assuming everything is just a vanilla flavored spectacle correction, <laughs> it seems to me you'd be able to do it. Yeah, you could definitely do, you know, by the 80 20 rule, with the current technology, you could do it. You know, the only problem is those 20%. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Um, very nice talk. I have two questions. Uh, first one is uh, Does your the IPAC system include other retinal? Uh, disease information such as AMD, age-related macular degeneration. My second question is, you know, these retinal diseases like develop or progress like rapidly. So if you take the picture at this moment and a few months later, it's going to be totally different, the, the, the founder's picture, I mean. So um, how would you, I mean, like, do you need, require the patient to in, take another picture or uh, how would you? Yeah, so, so there's certain think, intervals at which you take the pictures of the retina. And let me answer, let me address your first question first. With um, age-related macular degeneration, the problem is that it's difficult to detect that with just the pictures. You, you would need uh, maybe tomography or something else to be really detect with, with good sensitivity and specificity about age-related macular degeneration. The thing is that it happens, it doesn't happen that often in people that are younger. Um, so different population, you know, we, we can't really justify screening for age-related macular degeneration because there isn't a very good cure either right now. Um, so, so there you have the technology, you know, waiting around for the right clinical environment to, to, to fit into. With glaucoma, though, you can. You can do glaucoma detection with images, risk factors, and, and just a couple of other pieces of data. And some of our research, well, we did some, uh, some studies already that proved that it was effective. Um, and we're doing some more now to be able to incorporate that into the, into the mix. Glaucoma actually is a bigger cause of irreversible blindness than diabetic eye disease. So we're, we think that that would be something worth exploring. Um, as far as the other um, question, of, uh, as far as, you know, over time, you can bring up cases that you took from months before, and we do this especially with diabetics that are pregnant, you need to follow them closely. And any, any sign that, that there's been change needs to be addressed very, very uh, rigorously. Um, so yeah, you can compare from, from time to time. And there's more and more automated um, algorithms for being able to, to look at differences between images. And uh, I, another aside is that um, a rich area for research in image processing is retinal evaluation of diabetic eyes. You know, picking up microaneurysms automatically uh, through, through programs, computer programs, is, is, is really a popular um, project. So, so much so that they have this uh, competition now at Arvo. <laughs> They're going to have a little competition on, on uh, microaneurysm detection. See? And it'll be interesting to see who wins. It'll be interesting to see if the computers take over humans. <laughs> I said, don't worry about us telemedicine people. Watch out for the computers. <laughs> no. <laughs> Any other uh, questions? Okay, well, let's uh, thank Professor Quadros, and I'll see you next week. <laughs>